Hello, welcome back. This is Touchline Talk with me, Simon Goody, and today I have my guest here, Liam Arkley. Liam, hello. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good. Um, um, as how's it going? So, yeah, I just, just finished the training session, so as you can probably relate to, a um, <laughs> bit of fatigue, but raring to go for this one. I've been listening to the the previous um the the introduction podcast and I and I listened to the second one as well um recently and then we got in contact so it was kinda like strange like how it worked out. Um but yeah no looking forward to it. No, it's really uh you know really good. Really appreciate obviously you giving up your time. Um and probably the the unique thing for, for you obviously that probably the, the viewers are gonna be quite interested to to hear is obviously you got a completely different time zone to me. Where whereabouts in the world are you at the moment? I live in Osaka, Japan, so I believe I'm seven hours ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, you are. So it's very late. So uh, thank you for for staying up a little bit. You know, obviously after your session and and coming up, having a chat with us, so I really appreciate it. All good. Right, so Liam, just really, really quickly. Obviously, you know, we've we've teased the viewers a little bit, telling them uh, that you're in in Japan. What is it you're actually doing at the moment in Japan? I. I'm the head coach of my region. Um, should I say the name or can well, we we skip past Com- that? Yeah, completely. Yeah, Liverpool, yeah. Liverpool International Academy in Japan. Um, I'm the head coach of my region, and uh, that basically entails running our venues. So right now we operate with five different training days, and that's spread across four different venues, and. Um, I either take all the training sessions or oversee the training sessions that are ta- that are taken. Um, of course, we follow the academy curriculum and stuff, but of course, everything that happens on the pitch is, then comes back to me, and therefore, it's my responsibility to either, as I said, put on the training session or to make sure that the sessions that are going on elsewhere are at a, a good standard. Um, so that's what I do now, and. It's just a kind of, in our region, it only started up over a year ago. So it's kind of managing those early days and like how to kind of grow it. And we have ideas for where it's to go and stuff. Um, how it can improve now, but where it's ultimately going to lead to. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. As you can imagine, while I'm thinking about it now, we're always talking about like what's coming in the next year or whatever. So um, it's, it's good. It's really kind of exciting place to be. No, it's, it's it's very unique place to be. Obviously, Asia, you know, in terms of football stuff, is really developing, and some of the standards and the quality out there is is really really high. Obviously, you just have to look at the women's World Cup at the moment, and you know, you see the standard of the the players and you know, yeah. the methodology and stuff like that. And I guess the really exciting thing for me to to talk to you, you know, I know we'll talk about this a little bit sort of later on, but to to be there and. Obviously, I know you've got your your Liverpool sort of hat on in terms of your training methodology, but I guess mm. obviously you see a lot of the methodology and the structures in place from a, a Japanese football perspective as well. Yeah, so it's kind of like with anything, um, and it's especially with loads of clubs have academies abroad and stuff, and they, they follow the curriculum. But I think um, if you just stick to that, it, it doesn't really work. You have to kind of like make it work for the place that you're actually in. So that's something I learned pretty early doors as well. When cause I've not always worked in this job, but um, when I came into this job, I already understood like the Japanese way. But then I started with the Liverpool thing, get to grips with the, the curriculum and stuff with, or, that we had to deliver and the kind of ethos around it. But you can't, as, as me and my colleagues always say, we're not in England, so it doesn't work the same. Like, so, yeah. so you have to kind yeah. of make it suit a Japanese um, group and Japanese and what people are expecting to see. Um, but whilst also differentiating yourselves from other group, from other like teams, so you don't want to just do what everyone else is doing in Japan, but you also don't want to go so far away from like the norm that it becomes kind of too alien and un- unsafe, like culturally. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of hitting that yeah. nice balance with what you do in your training and how you do it things like that yeah no I, I, it's, it's, it's interesting you know and uh fair play for you for for being out there and going out there and and, and doing what you're currently doing i guess just one question i probably expect the the viewers are probably wondering is 
Can he speak Japanese? How's your Japanese? I speak Japanese. <laughs> how is it in the sessions? How, how do you find the language? No, it's fine. I mean, I've, so I'll give you, a, I mean, I don't know if this is the right time to go into that, but um, when I first came here, I was doing a coaching job that was run through, it was a football coaching job that was run through a programme. And most of the programme people are English teachers, but very, very small percentage of employed come in internationalised sports in Japan. So anyway, I was, I was plonked in this city, right, in south of Osaka, right, <laughs> and put on this, put into the, the, the team to take the team on this um, middle school team. And I came here with kind of ears open and ready to learn Japanese, but, like, to this, like, like extent, I wasn't expecting the like, kind of rush I was going to get. I didn't have a translator from the first day I was there. So it was me and 14-year-old boys who are ready, obviously, as you know, ready just to take the mic out of anyone like, in, any, in anything. And it's me rocking up there. So, yeah, you had to, like, learn very quickly because I wasn't, I wasn't going to get English going for 15 people or 16 people at the one time to suit one person. Yeah. I had to be the one that changed. Do you know, do you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. but for me, it was good because... You know, as while they'll take the mic, there's no pressure with young people really. Like, there's no like social because they're just young boys, 14, 15. So, if you make mistakes and stuff with your language, no one cares. It doesn't, there's nothing's on the line. As long as you can get your session things like out that you want to, it's fine. So, I mean, I had a pretty like rough intro like, introduction to um, Japanese, but <laughs> it stood, stood me in good stead. and it's it's kind of a almost an uncomfortable question when I get asked it now because I, I feel kind of like people never expect like people to learn languages like this and Japanese people don't expect foreigners to learn Japanese like this. Um, I don't want to be like, you know, like boasting, but I also don't want to say like, no, I don't. I, I want to say, oh, yeah, I do, but I want it to be normal. Do you know what I mean? But it'll never be normal. Yeah, so. yeah. Whenever no, anyone asks no, I mean, me, I'm just... kind of like, uh, That's huge, bit, isn't it? <laughs> I would think this sounds. I would think so if I was outside looking in, but because of my circumstance, mm. because of like the necessity, I don't see it as anything that un not like unusual. No, yeah, but yeah, like I understand why people would think, oh, that's really unusual. Do you know what I mean? But if you anyone yeah. was put in that situation, I think any, most people would come out with a decent level. Um, because they had yeah to. yeah so yeah and, and that's probably the, the the most important thing is I, I guess traditionally most people haven't put themselves in that situation they haven't put themselves in that position so for you to put yourself in that position that situation uh and obviously to come out of it with a second language and it being a, a second language that you know there must be such a hugely small percent percentage of uh British people who can speak Japanese. That, that yeah. is a, a really, really unique language to be able to speak. I mean, I, I, I can speak Spanish, but there are, I mean, there are other English British people that can also speak some Spanish. So I'm not as unique potentially as yourself. So that is something that I, that I, I take. Scottish. Narrow that down to Scottish <laughs> Japanese speakers. We'll see how many we have. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Liam, you know that is a really interesting sort of introduction into into what you're doing, and um, I think it's really, really fascinating. What I want to try and do now is just sort of just take it back a little bit and sort of learn a little bit how you got to the position you're currently in. So, if you can, just take us back a little bit. You know, what were the sort of your first steps into into football? I used to. I mean, similar story of a lot of coaches that didn't go on and play professional football or anything um i used to play football of course like with my um team when i was younger and played and you get to an age you kind of realize like all right this, this is going nowhere like I, I like playing because it's good and it's competitive and you can get that kind of like buzz from football which you did but you were, i was never going any further than that so um well, at the time when i was like 15 probably you know like you're, you're in school and they're ramming it down your throat about you have to like decide what you're doing otherwise the world ends and uh 
I think around the time I was in high school, I was thinking like, well, the only thing I care about is football, so I should probably work in football. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I can't be a player, so I should probably try and coach it. So I, I kind of tinkered with that idea for a, a little bit, and then I think my dad used to coach as well, coach me, and I think I was like, well, it would be interesting to see how I would go and do it myself. So the club that I played for, I went and coached the um, under-11s at the time, which is scary now because I'm seeing photos and they're all like, out in nightclubs and that, right? <laughs> Different story. Um, but yeah, uh, I went and coached the under-11s at the time and um, it kind of gave me that, like, feeling of, oh, this is so difficult having to, like, manage all these children and, like, deal with it. And I was only 16 at the time as well, so um, that was my first kind of, like, dip in the toe in the water, so to speak, with, with coaching. And it was, of course, like, very, like, basic and, I don't know, it was based on absolutely nothing other than stuff maybe I had done as a player and stuff. So age specific, age appropriate, I'm not so sure. Um, but it's interesting to kind of, I think, when I reflect back on that time, and especially when you read about online as well now, and I, you don't really see a lot of negative stuff online i.e. like the way that people like work and stuff you never see the bad stuff and whatever and i think it'd be interesting and of course useful for a coach who's 16 to know that it's all right to be like but to it's okay to be like well out of it like it's okay to be like well off the mark because i think you see if you're now going into coaching you see on linkedin and blah 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 xyz a licensed coach pro but whatever and you want to keep up with people like that, and you want to be like there, but you real you don't want to accept your like leagues behind or you're just totally different circumstances. And I think it would be important for people who are starting out to know that it's normal to be miles off it, and that's that's exactly what I was. Um, so the majority of the start of my coaching, um, and I, my colleague now put it really well. He he was a pro football player, and he says as a as a as a player, I'm a pro, but because he's only been coaching for three years, he says, as a, as a coach, I'm three years old. <laughs> and I thought that's, that's an true. excellent, that's true. excellent that's true. way to kind of put the whole thing, because then it kind of puts any perspective, like, well, you're not expected to know everything, mm -hmm. so you should just, you should just, like, put less pressure on, like, and just try and figure out what you're doing now, so um, that would have been nice to know then. And then certainly going on, I went on to coach uh, an under seventeens team, and then again you have different challenges because they are older and they're starting to have jobs and stuff and whatever, and uh, the the social dynamics very different, and how you interact with them, of course, is very different to how you interact with ten year olds. Um, so I, I think you learn a lot from that. I worked. I then I went on to work um, in America for a summer. Uh, the main reason behind it was really to prove to myself. I think that I could go and, and do it somewhere else. <clears throat> could go somewhere else. Um, and this sounds ridiculous to me now, but I could go somewhere for ten weeks and do it and handle it. Do you, know, you know what I mean? Um, America's a good one for that, isn't it? I mean, I, I've done America as well. And I think, you know, especially when you're young as a coach and you're from from Britain, I think America is a really good place to, you know, as you say, you know, sort of dip your toes into the water. It's English. You know, you're not going to be completely out of out of your water, out of your depth in terms of a foreign language. And, you know, you, you spend a little bit of time away from home. I mean, I remember when I went to America when I was 19, and you know the, the you know the, the experience that gives you at that time, like you're saying, you know, it gives you that sort of feeling for it, I guess. Yeah, I was similar. I was twenty, so it's um it's kind of like you know, can I can I go away? Can I do something else like different? Because you know, at that time, you're also of course drawn into everything that's happening around you, and of course, coming from the place that I come from. Uh, just, uh, everything's looking inwards towards that. So, like, everyone's bubble is that. You go somewhere else. Might only be America. Might only be 10 weeks. But it just gives you a different sense of what's out there, what's around. 
you meet different people who do different things and different interests. Don't get me wrong, the football side of it, coach wise, I'm not so sure. Um, i.e. what you'll be doing and, and that job for 10 years <laughs> questionable yeah. um, but uh, other than that the life experience or the, the kind of sense of like there's more out there for me, more to this like um, and I can use my my job to, to go and experience that and, and they can kind of work off each other um, I think that was a good realisation and from that point, I was kind of like determined that if I wasn't going to America, I was going somewhere else. Then COVID hit and I finished uni and I was kind of like determined that I was going to go to America and get a job there. So I thought it was great. And then I was online every day during COVID on LinkedIn, looking at jobs and whatever, job boards, whatever. And then I saw these Asian like jobs come up and it, I thought, well, why does it need to be America? I just apply to China and some job in Korea, a job in Japan, a um, job, whatever, right? Job in Bahamas, I applied to, applied to any of that, <laughs> right? Because I thought, well, if I can do, I want to see now if I can go somewhere else and do it for a year. Now, if I can do that for a year, then I can do whatever then. I can do a year anywhere. And uh, so that kind of like, confidence that I got from that took me to then take that job during COVID to go to Korea. Um, I mean, I spent... were, were you were you were you nervous at all, or what? What was sort of going through your through your head? Obviously, with with COVID hitting and it sort of originating from from China, from Asia, you know, and obviously these sorts of things come up. Did that did that ever really put you off, or uh, not really? Because I think um, um, COVID for me, the, the full situation was just. It was gonna like disappear eventually, and it was no particular person's fault. So it wasn't something that ever really crossed my mind. And actually, when I went to Korea, um, the kind of level compared to what I was living in before, like as in in Scotland, the kind of level of like um, diligence towards it was unreal. And at the time, I didn't have like vaccines or anything, so it was kind of reassuring to know that they didn't like they weren't so lax on it they were hardcore on like covid and it was kind of good because well you knew that it was you were kind of because it, it's strange talking about it now because mostly people probably don't care now right but at the time no one really knew <laughs> what what was no. what what would happen or whatever and especially if you didn't at the time there were no vaccines either so you didn't know like what what it might do or whatever. So it was actually good going to Korea because they were proper like on it and you get into that with with you get kind of like on board with that because oh, why wouldn't you? Whereas I felt like in in the UK it was it was the opposite. So like, it was it was refreshing to go to Korea actually at that time. Definitely. And yeah, no tourist. No. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean no you're completely spot on. I mean to to move at that time, obviously now, obviously a lot of people have for forgot about it, and obviously importance is is obviously completely different because we've got through that stage of our lives. But I remember because uh, I moved to Spain at exactly the same sort of period. COVID was very, very big in England, and you know I remember my my old head teacher and people said to me, you know, moving now is a bit risky. You know, we're not quite sure what's going to happen. And it, it was very much as you say, the unknown. You know, you don't quite know what the situation is, how it's going to develop. And, you know, probably similar to myself, you know, for, for yourself, just, you know, you just had such an urge just to go and try something new and you just felt it was the right decision. And obviously, you know, you obviously look where you are now and obviously that has paid dividends sort of thing. But, you know, at the time it was really nerve wracking. I can remember really being a little bit unsure, but you just kind of go for it, no? It's hard to, it's hard now for like, I think most people to kind of picture it anymore because the kind of like the kind of I don't know like the kind of size of it is gone now. It's just so it's such mm, a small yeah. thing now. But at the time, it was on everyone's mind, whatever. Um, so it it was a different time, and it was it was hard. I know exactly what you mean, though. Um, yeah, but no, it didn't ever didn't once cross my mind about going to Korea. 
No. Well, it, it's was, good. I, I, didn't... I was getting out of there. <laughs> I was getting out of, of Scotland at that time. Yeah. So then, so then, you know, the experience in in career. What what were you doing, and how, how was career for you? Uh, I was working with um, like an, a company that oh, it was a, a really amazing like facility, which again was just kind of like stuff that I hadn't seen before. And uh, I basically was on the the rooftop of this um, like shopping center in the middle of like Seoul, and like. Uh, they had like it was sponsored by Adidas, and they had like seven pitches on top of this rooftop, like uh, five wow. six or five pitches, and it was unreal, right? So we would have like these tra- small training sessions inside like a court and a cage, um, and it was all they did all like the recruiting through international schools around because we had partnerships with international schools as well, so. From a coaching side, to be able to coach in English and stuff was a total privilege. Um, and the exposure you were getting to like, it was on. It was really cool because these children were all like various age groups. They were all like speaking English because they were international schools. But then they were like talking to each other in French and then in Spanish and then blah blah blah. <laughs> and a boy who was there, seventeen years old, and he spoke like five languages fluently. Like wow. ridiculous. So it was that kind of like international feel f- for the full like the full thing. So it means that I've coached people from Holland and I've coached people from Belgium, Pakistan, America, Korea, Japan. Like I've coached children from like loads of different countries. So it was really cool a really cool experience and um really good company. Um and the guys that run it were really, really good and um it was just a shame how it because it was COVID related, how I ended up kind of leaving Korea. Um, I mean, because... just just very quickly, you you, you, know, you you were talking about their you know coaching and being involved with so many different nationalities and and people from all around the world. You know, obviously, you know you're you're in a foreign country at the moment working. Uh, that must have been a really interesting experience, and and I guess your knowledge of those cultures from those different players and people that you worked with must have given you such a a greater insight into some of their cultures and and how how potentially life could be like in in their countries, for example. If that makes sense. It was sense. interesting. Yeah, I know what you mean, but it was also a case that they're all very like um, kind of they're all kind of like going on the one kind of like culture, which was our culture, if you if you want, like our club. So I know what you mean because it was different. It was interesting to hear from different people on like. Their English was so like natural. You'd think they were from like London, right? The way that some of the boys are talking, and uh, but the way that they were like played football and stuff, and and they kind of I would ask them loads of different questions about like what kind of football do they like playing or like watching or whatever, and um, yeah, no, stuff like that was interesting. But it was amazing how they all kind of grouped, like even though there were people from loads of different places because they were all going to similar kind of schooling systems and have done, because they wouldn't have just lived in Seoul, lived in other places, they all kind of, even though they were coming from loads of different places, they were all kind of like homogenised, all very like kind of like the one kind of way. So it was, but it was very cool, very interesting conversations. Yeah. And then after, after that, I believe, then it you, you headed over to, to where you are now, no, to Japan. Yeah, so um, yeah, sadly the the facilities were really short and so, and they kind of just brought a uh, like uh, part, like uh, affiliation to an end. And uh, I ended up back in Scotland for a few months, and then because of COVID at the time as well, my next job was kind of like delayed. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I ended up in Scotland for uh, I think three months, which wasn't so bad. Um, it was good to kind of go back and like speak to people, but I think after three months you're kind of ready for like the next, the next one, kind of thing. And it yeah. was a job that I'd been offered before when I was in Korea, and it just couldn't happen because I was in Korea. And then I was offered it again, um, to go out. And then that's when I went over the end, and I think November twenty twenty one. That's how long. That's since then I've been here. And it was um, yeah, it was. 
I think I had a big regret from Korea because I'd always been in that kind of like English environment and always kind of been speaking to English speakers and stuff and like was doing Duolingo on my um, phone for Korean but like never like actually like going out there and like using it or whatever like just the yeah. old like thing in the shop or the restaurant I could ask them for like read it and like read the menu and ask for something right about that roughly that and I, I said to myself like right from now on if you go somewhere else that clearly doesn't work so just you need to just go for it and uh, I think that married well with my first job here so that's how I ended up with my with being able to speak Japanese as we were talking about earlier but that was one regret from yeah career that I, I really I don't want to repeat um because it, mm. it changes your whole lifestyle um big time yeah. and Korea was yeah. really difficult to live in sometimes especially when it comes to simple like hospitals blah 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 it's life becomes like so much quicker and easier like when you can speak in their language so um yeah, yeah. it's the same in coaching I guess you know it's the same in coaching and you know obviously the challenges you know you know, maybe when you're in, obviously, as you said before, in, in South Korea and obviously all of the players, their level of English was, was so good. It, obviously, it makes it difficult for it to be a necessity for, for someone to obviously go and go and talk or go and try and learn that, that second language. And obviously, yeah. as you're saying, you know, having you know that sort of reflection and those sort of uh, mini sort of little regrets from not um, learning the language, I think now, and this is something that I can really relate to you with, you know, your understanding of um, that country, the culture, the people, the relationships, how you connect with people, and ultimately then obviously how you go and coach people uh, is is massively important. Obviously, when you have the ability to to talk in in their native in their native language, and obviously, I guess you know you are making we are making when we go abroad, we are making the conscious decision to go and live in a different country and. Yeah. English might not be their first language. So really, you know, it is on us when you go to a different country to at least, you know, obviously learning language is really, really tough. It does take a lot of time. You know, there are lots of challenges to that, but you really do have to uh, be willing and undertake that challenge because obviously, you know, the rewards that it gives you, not only as a person, um, but, you know, the, the sense of need, and you know, to, to have that, I guess is is crucial. I guess you probably felt the same. Ah, uh, yeah, I kind of like battle with that idea now of like um, rocking up somewhere and expecting everyone to bend for me. It's like, do you know, what? I don't really like. Do you know what I mean mm. by that? I don't really yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like it. Um, and I know people will say like language isn't for them, but I do really, really find it like uncomfortable. Like now, the idea of I've I never use English with Japanese people ever now ever but i find the idea of it strange the fact that it's even like normal is is odd um so no um whenever anyone who doesn't who i've just met or whatever tries to speak to me in english it just gets brushed off and it's straight into japanese it's like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not doing it. if we were in another country yeah cool let's talk english but not here that's good um, that's good you know to be to be strong with that and to be like you know we are Obviously, it's difficult, uh, but to have that sort of mentality and go, no, we are in Japan. I'm going to talk to you in Japanese. Not only is is a, is a really good thing for you, but it just shows the level of importance that you put on that language and you understanding their culture and actually wanting to show that you've spent time learning their language, which you know is is a massive um, area of respect that I think you then show that 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 nation, that country, you know that. It is important to you. Because you, you get more than the word of mouth on the culture of a place. I Foreigners do this thing where they love stereotyping the whole place and like it's all word of mouth based on what other foreigners have said. And because no one goes deep enough like, into the foreign land, this isn't me saying this from like, my big perch, right? I'm not, but the problem I think is that people don't go deep enough with the people who of the country they're living in, i.e. me in Japan. If I just went along with everything anyone ever said about Japan, and that's my 
conclusion on the place, I would be so far from the truth. But because you can go in depth with people, you can talk to people, you get a serious understanding and you realise this place is no different from anywhere else in terms of people's attitudes and what people really think and how things are run and what happens. They're just subtle like cultural nuances there that make it different. But the way that people think and, t- and do things are very similar to like back home. I, I, it sounds ridiculous. Um, as I said, there are cultural nuances, but the way that people think and priorities and everything is just very similar. It's just people at the end of the day. But I think we like creating these like big like illusions or like big stories that are based on nothing more than assumption, in my opinion. Um, mm. But if you learn a language, you can go deeper and find the kind of truth of the place. And I think that's one of the most powerful things from my, this experience. And um, the thing is, as well, the access that it's given me to people who are, are like seriously like like knowledgeable, or like really good like people to take knowledge from because they've played football here, they've played football in different places, and like pro players. I don't need to go and seek some like English speaker that I've got these people that I can talk to, and um, it's so so useful. And I wouldn't have access to these people if I didn't know Japanese. So it's it just it's just a thing to think about for anyone who brushes off the eye the idea of learning a language it will get you so much further in my opinion from my experience yeah yeah no 100 percent. you know and i guess you know how how did you find you know when you when you first started taking sessions in in japanese to where you are now you know how you know obviously learning a language can obviously be very daunting and as you, as you said before you know obviously making mistakes is sort of you know part of that sort of journey but how what sort of things did you find really useful when you were trying to learn Japanese? Um I think number one, you listen and you watch and you you pick up the words that are used in the environment you're in. So of course the football words are all very similar anyway, so that's kind of taken care of the the actual like nouns, but the verbs that they use are obviously like very like specific to the so there's obviously within Japanese. But English words are, of course, used in football, offside, etc. And, you know, like as an example, everything like that is kind of like the same shoot, etc. But um, the, the most useful things I think I found were like how to learn words such as like come in, like gather, or like go wider, or like make it like come in narrower go wider, you want depth with, stuff like that. I think basic football things, the concepts that you can really build on, because if you don't have those, you can't really show, it just takes longer to show what you want to show. If you want, if you can do that, stuff like um, running and timing and changing direction and whatever, like if you can learn those kind of words, I think it gets... It, it can kind of like speed up what you're trying to show them, even if it's terrible, even if it's delivered terribly. Um, I think they yeah. can catch what you're getting on about if you're showing it at least and demonstrating. And I think that's huge as well. I think um, demonstration, as anyone who's ever worked abroad knows, is the is the <laughs> key is the key to yeah. any, any good session from, at the beginning. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, you know, obviously. Where where the football world is at the moment, and obviously language, it's you know it's such a multicultural uh, environment. So you know people like yourself that are uh, putting themselves out there and, and learning a second language and really you know taking in those experiences. Obviously, you know for yourself in the future, even for now, you know that the, um, the experience is a life experience that is going to give you the confidence. That's going to give you you know having that ability to to change languages that uh, can't be can't be underestimated. Um, one one question I had for you, and we'll just sort of take a little bit back to a, a football perspective, is obviously yeah. with the Women's World Cup on at the moment and uh, the Japanese are, are doing so well, I, I guess quite a few of the viewers are probably going to be quite interested to know, you know, with you being out there at the moment, you know, in terms of the methodology that you've seen, I know, you know, you spoke a little bit about obviously within Liverpool and stuff, you know, 
you kind of have your own uh, methodology, etc. But from from other places that you've seen and you know what they talk about football and their development process, how would you sort of summarise the the methodology that the Japanese use in terms of football? Specifically, I used to work in this university, right, and it was quite old school and quite um, university football was like America, whereby like you, a lot of pro clubs will pick players from universities and stuff, so it kind of works in that system. Of course, there are academies um, as well. But I used to work in this university. It was quite um, famous in my region, and uh, I used to coach with the C team there. And um, again, I, I was just kind of like, Wow, I maybe wouldn't do it this way, whatever. Like, but they did a lot of like unopposed repetition work, even with players who were university players, um, who could already do all these things like with ease. So I was always what I battled with. Kind of, well, if they can already do this, I control and pass. Why do we work on this? Why not just get them in a gate, like get them into a situation, and then build an image with them where they can use this, as opposed to just standing in a like a, a diagonal uh standing in a diamond and just passing that round the diamond um or at least put a defender on them for pressure and they need to check the, the, where the opponent is so that they can determine where their touch will go something right nothing just like ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. change direction ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. so you'll find like that's not the be all end all for the whole country there'll be places that don't do it like that but um, with my place in particular, it's very, very, very um, rigid on stuff like that. And, um, the women's team were pretty strong, but again, they were always doing stuff like that. And I think technically, you're always guaranteed to get like, Being the boy I coached with um, earlier, I've got this boy in who's um, from London, and he's living around here as well. And uh, he said to me, I've had good teams before, and I've had like, players that are better than this, like one or two players, but to have like the lowest player in the team at this level of like technical ability is crazy. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually true because you've got like a team, you've got like a group of say 12 year olds and they can all play like, and, and like technically good and ready to play, technically good and ready to play the game. Um, whereby the game that they play doesn't stop because people are taking rubbish touches or whatever like it can flow mm. and it, which I think is hugely important for the kind of like quality of the game that they're playing and, and then how they can learn within that because you know yourself when you've got a player who like is you've got loads of different players and different abilities in the one group and you're trying to coach something and and say for it's even a basic thing and players lose confidence in other players because that player they know can't like control their pass or something you know like that yeah. that sort of stuff you don't really we don't really see that all that much because players are just generally technically decent um, but I mean, what, why, like from 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 those younger age groups, like why, what would you, you know, from from what you've seen, if you were to try to pinpoint how it's got to that stage, you know, they're, they're so good. I know you spoke about, you know, with the university teams and stuff like, that, you know, they do a lot of unopposed practices and stuff like that. But you know, from those younger age groups, how much of that have you seen, and, and what could you sort of contribute you know, that that high technical standard towards? Um, I'll be honest, I haven't seen an academy team train here, um, i.e. like a top club's academy, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. But I've seen the people around us training and stuff and doing totally different stuff from what I would be doing, right? And, um, for example, like before they join, some groups before they even start training, they've got to do like 100 keepy ups each and like, <clears throat> um, when they're in, it's all very like cone work and like touching into like a space and then playing it and touching into a space, play it, touch space, play it, like, and it's just ba bum ba bum ba bum. Um, and that's the but that's the gist of the training session. Like, there's a group that we coach on a Tuesday and on the on the pitch next to us. There's so many kids in that in that pitch. They don't even get to play a game of that. Of that. Like, they have so many kids in the one like pitch. That all they do is like spaced out technical work like constantly they don't get a game of that so like things like that it's like 
is it really that important to have so many kids in the one place to make money? Um, and is it also that important that you work for so long on technical work that they never actually get to use it? So I think you could put it down to like the first touch in the past and stuff is usually pretty good because they work on that like quite a lot. Mm. So it's so it's going to happen. Um, from what I've seen. Um, but the where where things fall down sometimes is like as coaches you want people, your players and whatever to think for themselves and do things um, as a team based on how they see the game and of course you have principles and stuff that of course everything like is underpinned by but ultimately they're on the pitch so they have to decide and um, it's hard when you're asking questions because you don't get many answers no matter how many different types of ways you're trying to ask the question um, I ask, we do this thing with the training we'll split them into like teams for like small sided games and I'll say like choose your team name and it'll be like Salah team or like Van Dyke team or something they'll say something kids wouldn't even like give me a team name yesterday I was saying to him oh like what team he's like oh eh, anything's good and I was like just the same. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It could be that kind of like culturally kind of like they don't want to put themselves on the line or like stick out. Um, so that that kind of leads into the football side as well, whereby like you can have that kind of like no response, silence and like quite a lot. Um, which Which again comes into this like, well, because everything that they do in their daily lives is very command style, mm. am I in one training session going to change that? No. So am I better just going command style then? Because we're going to just hang around waiting for an answer that won't come. You know, you know yeah, what I mean? Interesting. Yeah, um, it's interesting. It's interesting, yeah. I think if you went on any coaching course and said that, they'd kick you out. But I think <laughs> you, need to read, you need to read the situation and like see if you're not getting there with like whatever you're trying and the way you're trying to do it and I'm not an expert so of course this is something I want to learn as a coach different into learning styles and blah 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 and how you can be more effective um, but sometimes command styles just works because you're just going to hang around otherwise and you know what happens like as soon as there's a lull then the concentration drops and then the session's not as good anymore so you want to just keep it like you want to ask them you want to give them the opportunity but sometimes you need to just go boom. And I think that's something you need to learn. For, you can't just be ignorant to it and you can't, you can't change their culture and, and your training session, even if you want, no, even if it fits you. No, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, and you're, you know, what you're saying is, is, is really nice to, to hear and interesting to, to listen. You, know? you, are, you are there, you know, and like you said a little bit before, some of the stuff you have to do, you have to adapt. You have to adapt to their culture, what is, you know, more or less sort of traditionally done. Obviously, you, you, you are trying to put your own sort of stamp on it from a, from a club perspective, obviously, with, you know, obviously with the club that you're involved in at the moment. But you're right, it's interesting over the way of uh, the different learning styles, how you adapt to that. And it's interesting, obviously, um, as you're saying, you know, it's very rigid, very command style sort of with a lot of the work and the coaching there. So obviously, if you then work in a different way, as you're saying, you, you know, you could be waiting a long time for, for those sorts of responses. So it's really interesting to, to hear that. And, you know, you, you don't you don't get those sorts of experiences. You don't broaden your knowledge and your experiences without putting yourself in that sort of situation. So, you know, for you as an individual, you know, as a coach, those sorts of experiences are obviously going to massively improve you so that, you know, future experiences, future roles, etc. you know, when you come up, with different situations and scenarios, you've got those experiences to to pull from, which ultimately, you know, uh, in terms of coaching, we know is is really really important to better understanding, you know, all of the different players because you know, football is so multicultural now. You know, you go anywhere in the world and you probably bump into people from from your country or from adjacent countries, and you know, those mm. sorts of experiences that uh, you're getting is is going to put you in good stead in the future for sure. Well, yeah, it's something that I think we don't, I don't really hear a lot of on podcasts and stuff is like actual 
something specific that someone says. I feel like everything's just brushed over and like generic sometimes. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. think. So I think it's useful if someone actually says it how it actually is. Um and that's kinda like why I was talking about that there because um again it's not fashionable back home because no. of yeah. what well, nowadays like philosophies and stuff and the way the best practice etc but i think the reality is this and the guy i work with who again access to because of language he says in japan children are taught everything even up to the way that the food goes into their mouth so how are you going to change that in a training session and i and i totally agreed with him um and it's it's uh it's something to bear in mind for sure mm-hmm. Yeah, no, interesting. Well, Liam, just I know we're just sort of kind of sort of coming to to the end today, but really, you know, what I wanted to do is just try and summarise a little bit from yourself for for those people that might be looking to to take similar sorts of steps in terms of going abroad. Uh, that might, you know, that might be obviously, you know, your first steps when you went to America, obviously, or in the roles that you're in now. You know, um, what advice would you give to those coaches that are thinking about, you know, taking the next steps or going abroad? I think it's important that you make yourself relevant. And I think um, how you might do that, for example, when I was at university, I realised, well, if I just have boys club teams on my CV, it doesn't really stand out to anyone. But if I get like an actual club badge, even if that's working like in the community as a volunteer, it doesn't matter. You've got then a recognised club badge on your CV that all automatically gives you more validation, even though they've never seen you coach or anything. Um, and that's what I that's why I did that specifically. Um and then as soon as I was interviewed for one thing, it was like, Oh, okay, Motherwell, like, because people might know Motherwell Football Club in, in Scotland. Um but it didn't take much for me to actually get into that role and it was a good experience. And I forgot to mention that as well. And uh I think I right, so through that make yourself kind of relevant and um I think you need to be aware of what companies and clubs abroad are looking for and then how you kind of match up with that um and yeah if you're looking to go abroad i would say it's difficult if you put all your eggs in one basket with one place it might be easier if you just kind of roll the dice on anywhere to be honest because you're going to get a good experience i say that to anyone it doesn't matter where you go what you do something extra that extra that you've done um that you that getting back going but staying back home just you won't get that mm. i always say like i always think like something's been added on my brain kind of like this my good my brain has gotten like there's, there's more to it now um just again that sense of like what's out there and whatever um so again yeah, if, if you want a kind of like easy introduction to life abroad there are always the america camp jobs and you'll get that mm. feeling of like away from home and you'll meet loads of good people and it's a good it's good fun um and then yeah i think uh i think yeah as anyone says ever like if you're going to go abroad just my advice to people is uh open your ears and shut your mouth and then you'll learn more um as opposed to the other way around if you go in all guns blazing it will be a very difficult experience for you so you're better trying to listen to listen to local people first and don't get drawn into what other people say um who are also foreigners because it can often be very far from the truth and you won't learn the the place you're in by talking to foreigners so by and large um yeah so listen more talk less until you've learned enough to talk is my uh, advice to people who go and live abroad because it's not easy but it's made a lot easier when you kind of understand the place and everything gets easier within the place because of that so and then yeah as for football i, I, I realized this turned into a language podcast um as for football uh yeah i think watch as much as you can of what's around um don't snub anything because there are always good coaches everywhere there's a reason you can't get coaching jobs in japan because they have loads of good coaches here already um so yeah, there are loads of good coaches anywhere you go in the world. You might not find them straight away, but don't snub anything because there will always be something that you've not seen or done before 
that maybe you could maybe add it in and take somewhere else. Um, so I think, again, just go in with your eyes open um, and don't judge things too quickly because you need to understand why it's done that way first uh, before you can start judging people for what they do. And uh, I think you'll learn loads from other people if you go in with that kind of attitude. Because um, as you said earlier as well, Simon, uh, you're there through privilege, so you you should um, you should go in there ready to learn and ready to kind of like um, to make the most of your opportunity. But yeah, you are away from home and you're away from comfort. Um, so always have something in the back of your mind of maybe what you're going to do next or where things are going as you should anyway probably as a coach what direction you're going in and maybe a next kind of like plan B if, if anything bad happens because you know that not all coaching jobs abroad are rosy and good mm-hmm. situation by and large they are not so um, always have something set up or have an idea of what you want to do next and it will be a, li- a little bit easier for you when Maybe something goes wrong or whatever. That's my advice. Pretty long winded, yeah. um, and I'm not very good at cutting to the point. So <laughs> no, but it's it's true. It's yeah. good, you know. I've you know as as you said, I think a couple of points in there are really really key and, and important for me. I think you know when you go somewhere new, watch, listen, and learn, and then after time when you really understand what is going on, the culture, a bit more of the language, how things work. Okay, then you know you've built up a certain level of respect because you've been there for for so long, and then that's when things can start to open up and you can start to then give feedback. And I think, I, you know, the, the the last point you just mentioned there in terms of not necessarily having a, a backup plan, but having a, a plan as in what's next. You know, it's very rare sometimes that you know the you know the negative stories or the unsuccessful stories always get promoted. But it is true that a lot of experiences for people to go abroad are not always rosy. They're not always good. Yeah, and you know, I've I've heard I've heard stories of, of coaches going out to different places, they arrive, there's no contract, there's no money. Uh yeah. and you know, those those opportunities uh have changed during their flight, for example, and they get there and then there's nothing. So I, I think that bit of advice from yourself there is is really key. I really like it. Um, and it is something that people do just have, just need to have in the back of their minds because you know things things do change, especially when you're not known and you don't you know know them face to face, and you know you've made connections online or you've interviewed online, and um, obviously it's very unfortunate when those things happen. But I think what you said there, you know, getting to the point uh, is is crucial. Just have that in the back of your mind, going right. If this fails or if something happens. What am I going to do? I, I think that's yeah, a really, really good point. Totally, but don't forget to kind of enjoy what you're doing right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes we forget that, though. Sometimes we do forget <laughs> that. It's important not to forget that. Well, Liam, um, thank you very much for your time. I know it is uh, super late for you over in in Japan, um, <laughs> so we won't take up any more of your your time. Um, really, really appreciate it. If people have got questions for you, uh, they can put them in the comments. If they want to get in touch with you, as long as you don't mind, if anyone drops you a message and say, look, I want to get in get in touch with them, as long as you don't mind, I'll pass on their their details to you. Um and yeah, it's been been really good to to hear your story and the challenges and experience that you've got. And uh I wish you all the best for for the next, you know, the next year, the the coming months and stuff, and hope you keep enjoying it and keep taking a lot out of it. Yeah, cheers. It's good. Um Going on talking about yourself for a while was a bit of a strange one, but uh, no, it's good, and it was a good opportunity, and if anyone wants to get in contact with me or whatever it may be, um, I'm always free on, on LinkedIn, as I mentioned earlier, quite a frequent user, yeah. so yeah, you'll find me. Great stuff. Nice one, Liam. I'll, I'll make sure I uh, send anything over, and yeah, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Liam.